next topic uh, for this conference is the assumption. And again, we have to understand everything that happens with Our Lady happens as one thing unfolding more beautifully into something else, a, a, a path, a certain path. And of course, the assumption is the crowning of our Blessed Mother's life. When our Lord is in, at the wedding feast at Cana with uh, his mother and some of his disciples, she turns around and says a very curious thing to him. Now, understanding that in the Middle Eastern culture, uh, hospitality or lack of hospitality is a very, very grievous thing. It's kind of grievous for you know, almost all cultures. You don't you know, have guests and then sort of treat them like garbage. But in the Middle East, to do that, in the Middle Eastern culture, to do that is really, like, that's just absolutely a horrible thing to do. Horrible thing to do. So they're all at this wedding, and they run out of wine. Woo Not good. Insulting to your guests that you didn't splurge enough on them. A horrible horrible set of circumstances. Not just embarrassing, that's bad enough, but it's insulting. You're embarrassed, they're embarrassed for you, your guests, and you have insulted them by not preparing enough for them. Of course, the implication is that because you didn't care enough for them. You were miserly, saved some of your money for yourselves, etc., etc., whatever it is. Our Blessed Mother, recognizing this, turns to uh, turns to Jesus and says, they have no wine. Now, one of the things you always kind of want to look at when you're looking at Scripture is, why is a certain passage in Scripture? We know that the vast majority of things our blessed Lord said are not in Scripture. They're not recorded in Scripture. Certainly recorded in the hearts of the apostles and our blessed mother and how they relate to people when they go out and start preaching and everything after our Lord ascends to heaven. But in the written word of God, we know everything isn't there because it says it twice. It says it at the end of chapter 20 of the Gospel of John and the end of chapter 21 of the Gospel of John. Both times it says, if everything our Lord had said uh, was actually recorded, there would not be enough books in the whole world to contain everything he said. It says it right there. So, why is it in the wisdom of the Holy Spirit that some things are recorded in sacred scripture and others aren't? You know, the Holy Spirit is his own editor. I'll leave this one out and let this develop later on through the uh, learning and grace of the, as the deposit of faith and the development of doctrine occurs. And this one I'll put in right from the get-go, straight there in writing. So why does the Holy Spirit say, uh, inspire the apostles, uh, inspire John to write that this event? If you look at it from sort of the Protestant point of view, this is kind of a put-down to Mary. Hey, they're out of wine. Well, why are you telling me that, woman? It has nothing to do with me. My hour hasn't come. Hey, imagine that. She's telling me they're out of wine. Why do I care? That's the way this scene gets portrayed when it's being described. It's sort of a further proof that our Lord and the, the relationship between our Lord and our Lady was just kind of not that big of a deal after she gave birth. Nothing could be more insulting to the mother of God and to God himself. God, who wrote the fourth commandment, honor your mother, your father, and your mother, would not then go break his own commandment by dissing her in front of everybody at the table. So, Jesus' response to Mary, as Archbishop Sheen tells us, is best translated, the most faithful translation is, <clears throat> woman, what to thee, to me? Not, what does this have to do with me, or I don't really care, or why are you bothering me with this, or however it gets portrayed. Woman, what to thee, to me, my hour has not yet come. There are three parts to that that we need to look at to, again, understand the deep relationship between our Lord and Our Lady. First of all, woman. If the only gospel we had was the Gospel of John, we would have no idea what the name of the Mother of God is, because John never utters it. So all throughout the Gospel of John, 
we hear woman from Jesus. Why? He's referencing woman, the woman of Genesis. I will put hatred between you and the woman, between her offspring and yours, and she will crush your head. So he makes that constant connection. Our Lord makes that constant connection. The Holy Spirit, by inspiring John to write it in this fashion, makes that connection. He makes it explicit. The second phrase, what to thee to me. What to thee to me. What is the case for me is the case for you because we are that closely united. You are the woman of Genesis. I predicted you at the fall of man, at the dawn of mankind. I predicted you. That's how closely united we are. What to thee, to me. My hour has not yet come. What's he saying? What is she saying? Jesus, they have no wine. Well, what's the implication there? Fix it. <laughs> Moms, you know how that goes. <laughs> Your mother does not have to say to you, take out the garbage and wash the dishes now. All she has to do is say, the garbage hasn't been taken out. And you get the idea. The dishes are dirty. Moms with very few words and a lot of meaning. Um, she's telling our blessed Lord that, you know, she's so concerned about the, the couple being married and the family and all of that, and they've run out of wine. This is a horrible embarrassment, a rotten insult. Jesus, fix it. This is a bad situation. You fix it. And I know you can because I know who you are. <laughs> so, so Jesus, fully aware that he can fix the situation, turns to her and says, What to thee to me? You and I are so united in everything. Everything. Because remember, mother, of everyone born of woman, only you can truly say of God, bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. That's how united we are, Mom. Whatever affects me affects you. Whatever. What to thee to me. My hour has not yet come. If if you want me to set my foot on the road to Calvary, starting now, which will surely happen because the moment I perform my first miracle and begin to reveal my divinity, my road to Calvary, my hour, now the clock has started. And that means that if I am proceeding to Calvary, you are coming along with me. What to thee, to me. If my suffering is to begin, so is yours, mother, woman. You will end up standing at the foot of the cross and the prophecy of Simeon will be fulfilled. And the sword of thine own soul shall pierce. You will become mother, the mother of sorrows. Right now, you are the mother of Jesus. But if I do this for you, at your request, you will become the woman. Not just mom anymore, but the woman. Now, what to thee to me? My hour has not yet come. What do you say, Mom? 
And she turns to the wine stewards and says, in her last recorded lines of scripture, do whatever he tells you. She knew full well, she may not have known all of the individual details of how they would play out, but she knew full well when she said that, that she initiated the road to redemption for her son and brought herself along on it. What to thee, to me. So Jesus begins his hour. It takes three years for this hour to reach its climax, but he begins his hour. And our Blessed Mother there, as we see in various parts of the Gospels interwoven, is right there. And of course, is at the foot of the cross with him too. And here she is now at the foot of the cross. And again, from the cross, we hear that cry again, woman, woman. It's very beautiful. Very seldom do all four Gospels recount a specific fact or a specific detail, uh, almost word for word. That happens here and there, but it happens rarely. But the location of where our blessed Lord is crucified, the name of the place is spelled out in all four Gospels. Golgotha, the place of the skull. You will lie in wait serpent, and strike at her heel, and she will crush your head. She is standing at the foot of the cross, at the place of the skull, a participant in the crushing of the head of the serpent as God redeems mankind on the cross with the body given to him by her. Wow. Wow. Again, does this sound like, you know, just some woman God kind of picked out of nowhere and just said, here, I'm going to use you as a doorway. Boom, I'm here. Okay, nice hanging out with you. Bye. The relationship between our blessed Lord and our blessed mother, those two hearts, the sacred heart and the immaculate heart, a sword thine own soul shall pierce, so that the secret thoughts of many may be laid bare. And where does that prophecy come from, from Simeon? It's the conclusion of the prophecy of Jesus. This child shall be responsible for the rise and fall of many in Israel, a sign that shall be contradicted, the cross beams of the cross, and as he is on that cross, a sword your own heart shall pierce, soul shall pierce. And here it is, finally, 33-ish years later, and here's the prophecy being fulfilled. But as that Simeon prophecy is being fulfilled, so is the prophecy of God the Father. I will put hatred between you and the woman, between her offspring and yours, and she will crush your head. How does she crush his head? She gave God Almighty the flesh he used to crush the head of the serpent at the place of the skull. Everything in Catholic theology and truth is so wedded together and so beautiful that you simply cannot separate one thing from another. You can't do it. You can't do it. So our Blessed Mother stands there in this deep, intimate, the, the most intimate relationship that anybody could ever have with God, and still could ever have with God, and says not a word. Her soul must have been torn up inside beyond just the natural maternal aspect of watching her son undergo the physical torture, but she knew the spiritual torture of what was going on as well. She had her own 
Gethsemane there at the foot of the cross. And God allowed her to see it and witness it because he wanted her to be a participant in the suffering so that she could be all the greater participant in the joy. There is, as Bishop Sheen said, no Easter Sunday without first a Good Friday. And this was her Good Friday. And what sorrow must have ripped through her as her son's body was put into her arms. And all of those beautiful passages we hear in sacred scripture of her relating back to Jesus as a small child. And we hear, her, we hear the Holy Spirit saying she pondered all these things in her heart. The shepherds came that she had been announced that they'd been announced to by the heavenly hosts and she pondered all these things in her heart. And the angel Gabriel comes to her and says that you will be the mother of the son of God and she ponders all these things in her heart. And now here she is with the cold corpse of her son laying in her arms at the foot of the cross. What agony she had to endure through all of that. And a sword your own heart shall pierce. And yet she is the one who caused him to set his foot on this path first. My hour has not yet come. Do whatever he tells you. So our Blessed Mother's life continues. She's with John now because there are no brothers, because there are no other sons or daughters of Mary, which is why our Blessed Lord assigns her to the care of John. But something greater beyond just the assigning of his mother's earthly care takes place on Calvary at the place of the skull. There is that second sort of mysterious part of the prophecy of God the Father in the garden. I will put hatred between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. Who is the offspring of Mary? Well, certainly Jesus. But, and this is back to typology, as we know that Jesus is the new Adam, because St. Paul specifically says that, we know that Mary is the new Eve, because Jesus has a mystical union with our Blessed Mother, and the offspring of the woman emerge, begin to emerge right there at the place of the skull in John. Woman, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. The church even now is beginning to emerge. And these are the sons of the offspring of the woman. The new Adam and the new Eve spiritually consummate and the redemption of mankind begins to be fulfilled. All the prophecies are now brought to fulfillment. All of them. So the time comes that our Blessed Mother's life here on earth, time here on earth comes to an end. And as we read earlier, I'll read it again for you. In the words of the dogma of Pope Pius XII on the Assumption, Mary 
the immaculately perpetu immaculate perpetual virgin mother of God, after completion of her earthly life, was assumed body and soul into heaven. Well, that's ridiculous. Nobody can be assumed in the body and soul into heaven. That happens at the glorification of the body. There you Catholics go again, making stuff up. All because you want to worship plaster statues and light candles to them. In 2 Kings, chapter 2, we hear, this is Elisha and Elijah walking along. As they walked on conversing, a flaming chariot and flaming horses came between them. And Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elijah was taken body and soul into heaven. It says it right there. In Genesis 5, 24. Then Enoch walked with God, and he was no longer here, for God took him. That is not how the Jews say somebody died. Took him means took him body and soul. And if we have a question of exactly what that means, well, it's always good to let Scripture interpret itself. Because in the letter of Hebrews, referring to Enoch being taken body and soul up into heaven, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5 says, By faith Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. And, quote, he was found no more because God had taken him. Enoch, Elijah, from the Old Testament, were taken up into heaven body and soul. Can God not suspend from his own general practices if God wants to? Of course he can. He already did in the Old Testament. So now here we have the most perfect creature ever made, ever willed by God, infinitely willed to be perfect. And there is the beautiful line from the Psalms, nor will corruption know her. We'll not taste death. Why? Well, go back to what, this is why all of the dogmas of the church fit together. If our blessed Lord can see, uh, makes Our Lady be conceived without stain of original sin, so she doesn't have to die because she doesn't know sin, and he makes her perpetually virgin before, during, and after, and he has so longed to be with his love, it makes absolutely no sense. It is divinely contradicting that if he would raise Elijah and Enoch, body and soul, into heaven, who were less than Our Lady, and they were great, and they were less than Our Lady, that he would let her go into the grave and corrupt and rot. That the Holy of Holies would be desecrated by the effects and the consequences of sin is a contradiction in God that he could not allow to happen. Could not. Moreover, moreover, this is the woman. This is the woman who crushed the head of the serpent. And what ultimately did the serpent introduce into the creation of God? Death. Death, corruption. Now, if Our Lady did actually die, this is not a point of you'll notice, it's the, the, it just says that um, after completion of her earthly life, many, many, many great theologians and fathers and doctors and saints have all speculated that probably, and this is just learned opinion, probably Our Lady did die. But of course the uh, many of the Eastern Fathers you know, say that, well, she fell asleep, but uh, that's, all of that's just you know, a kind of a theological speculations on something we're not sure of. We'll find out on the last day, uh, or maybe at our own private judgments. But um, in either case, it seems 
more than plausible that our Blessed Mother would want to undergo everything that her own divine son did, even that moment of death. Maybe she didn't. Maybe our Lord spared her from that. It, it's not the point. The point is that for her to go into the grave and rot, no way. Absolutely no way. Our Blessed Mother, the archetypes, that, or the types that we speak of of our Blessed Mother in the Old Testament is that she is the Ark of the Covenant, she is the New Eve, and she is the Queen. These three things, the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant, if you go back and you read uh, about the construction of the Ark of the Covenant, it was given uh, in the Old Testament, God gave the instruction on every last detail of what the, how the Ark of the Covenant was to be constructed, what it was to be look like, what it was to look like, what the materials were to be used. Every last detail. Every last detail. How would you like to get a blueprint from God to make something? Talk about a micromanager. <laughs> That's not right. No, do it again. <laughs> so, and why? Because the Ark of the Covenant was to be his, the, the, the container of his word. His written word, the Ten Commandments were in there, the manna from the desert were in, was, uh, was in there, and uh, uh, Aaron's staff was in there. A truly important, remarkable vessel was the Ark of the Covenant, and built by the specific instruction of Almighty God. Because it was to contain his written word, the word of God. Well, he applies this same thing, template, if you use a 21st century expression. He applies this same template to the construction, as it were, of the Ark of the Covenant of himself. If he takes such care to build this Ark, how much more care would he take in building the living Ark, the living tabernacle? So when our Blessed Mother goes to Elizabeth, that is truly the first time a monstrance comes out in public, bearing the flesh of the Son of God. During benediction, as obviously many, many of you know, at the point of benediction, the priest who stands there in persona Christi, will not touch the monstrance. I have the big cape thing. When I was an altar boy, I always used to, because I was short, I always used to step on it and trip, and the priest stood up, and I'm standing on it, and he pulls back. And so I'm very familiar with that cape. <laughs> and he takes it, and he wraps it lovingly around the base of the monstrance, because he will not touch it, because it contains Jesus Christ. Nothing can happen to this living monstrance. Our Blessed Mother becomes the first Eucharistic procession in history when she brings our Blessed Lord to Elizabeth and to John. So if she cannot undergo the corruption of the grave, nor will my beloved no decay, well, where does she go? We have a little bit of a precursor here already. Elijah and Enoch. She goes body and soul into heaven. Little apologetics. Nowhere in the Christian world are there the relics of Mary. They don't exist. And that, to borrow a phrase, would be the mother load of all relics. <laughs> Nowhere... Does anybody, has it ever even been recorded in any of the annals of sacred history for 2,000 years that, hey, here's Mary's foot bone, or here's Jesus' mother's, you know, hair, or, you know, head, or whatever? You won't find them because it never happened, because there are, the, the, her body's in heaven with her son. There are no relics, first-class relics, to be had. Interestingly enough, to show you how important uh, it was to be associated with Mary, uh, uh, there were at least two different towns 
um, uh, in the uh, uh, early Christian time that claimed to be the town of Mary, both fighting for that honor. No, no, she lived here. No, she lived here. No, you're wrong. No, you're wrong. Let's start a war. No, you know. Imagine, imagine if somebody said, aha, I have the hand of Mary. Here's the hand bones of the mother of Jesus. No, because there are none. As we all know from people who may be listening to this and not understanding the full import of that, uh, Catholics were, and pretty much still are, uh, kind of a little crazy when it comes to getting body parts. <laughs> Well, that sounds horrible. <laughs> but why? Because we are a people, we are a faith invested in the desire to want to touch, to be with, to be in proximity to. And look, doesn't everybody do this also? I and mean, this isn't just kind of a Catholic thing. We, we take it to quite the example or quite the extreme, but all kinds of people do this. Isn't that the whole point of like when you go on a tour, one of those things that your mom and dad make you go on in eighth grade or ninth grade summer? And you go, oh, I've got to go on this tour of American history. And this is the room where Lincoln slept. Not that room, but this one. You're like, oh, this is the room where Lincoln slept? George Washington ate here. Oh, those were George Washington ate there? Here's George Washington's false wooden teeth. Oh, these are the actual teeth. See, everybody does this. We just get the bad rap for it. Um, but, uh, so, why? Again, because of our human nature. We want to be near things. We want to touch things. We want to have the sense of we were there. This is where it happened. That's what the person wore. That's the thing. I was in France at the... Uh, uh, we were visiting with a, a bishop in France a couple of weeks ago. And uh, we were just getting ready to leave for the airport. And while we were in his, uh, the chapel in his house, um, uh, we were kneeling there just getting ready for Mass. And uh, he made a passing comment as he walked past us. He just whispered and said, oh, that just got delivered uh, to us last week. That's the stole of St. John Viotti. We're like, what? <laughs> so, of course, got up and gave it a kiss. And, Why? Because you're connected to it. Because it's all about being connected. Catholicism is about being connected to God. And since we are of matter and flesh, wherever there is matter and flesh, we want to be connected to it. We want to be connected to it to God. We have a dim reflection of that in how lovers walk down the street holding hands. Why can't you just put your hands in your pocket and walk down beside you? Does this mean you love each other less? No, but you want to be connected because we're all about that. You have to be connected somehow. That's just how we are. So, Jesus has a body in heaven. He took it up with him when he ascended to heaven. And whatever the tradition is, roughly 30 years later, he wants his mommy. Now, he wasn't going to have her live until she was... 4,263 years old, he wanted his mommy. Why? Because he wants to be connected to her in every possible way he can. You know, one of the beautiful things of Catholicism, again, this is the, when we're looking at Scripture, a point I meant to make earlier, there are three different ways to look at Scripture or look at a teaching of the church or a truth. Is it scriptural, meaning is it right there? Is it uh, non-scriptural or non-biblical? Or is it anti-scriptural or anti-biblical? Many, many, many people who are Protestants say, kind of have the opinion in religious matters that if something is not overtly scriptural, it is therefore anti-scriptural. That's not true. There are loads of things that simply Scripture doesn't make reference to, one way or the other. It doesn't mean because Scripture is silent on something, it's automatically non-scriptural, uh, I mean anti-scriptural, not at all. Not at all. Um, only once in all of Scripture uh, do we hear a reference to Jesus eating, and that was after the resurrection, when he was a little ticked off 
that the apostles, when they didn't believe him and thought he was a ghost, it says he, kind of, it says he upbraided them for their non-belief on Easter Sunday night. And he said, well, you think I'm a ghost? Bring me something. He brought him a little piece of boiled fish and he ate. He said, see, look, there, ghosts don't eat. And he upbraided them for their non-belief. That's the only time we hear in Scripture that Jesus ate. He personally ate. Well, since it says he didn't eat, are we just to assume that he didn't eat anything for 33 years? No. So something can be non-biblical, meaning it's just not talked about in Scripture, but still be the truth. It doesn't say that Jesus liked peanut butter or peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. I don't know. But just because it's not there doesn't mean he hated them. He, he invented them, so... Thank, thankfully. Um, and he invented Oreo cookies, too. <laughs> Another Oreo fan over there. Um, so as we look and see what all these different... Okay, so Jesus is here, and something is non-biblical... Where does it say in Scripture, think hard, this is kind of a, a bit of a brain twister, where does it say in Scripture that our blessed Lord appeared to Mary after the resurrection? Think hard. Where does it say that? Where does it make allusion to that? I'll give you a clue. It's not in the Gospels or the Old Testament. And I'll give you another clue. It's not in any of the rest of the New Testament either. <laughs> it doesn't say it anywhere. It doesn't say anywhere that Jesus appeared to his own mother after his resurrection. So therefore, are, to we, are we to conclude that he just never appeared to her? He never showed himself to her. She who stood at the foot of the cross, this the woman of Genesis, she who participated in the crushing of the serpent's head, who brought redemption, uh, who was used to bring redemption to the world through giving of her, uh, her consent so that God could take her flesh and die on the cross with it. This woman never gets to see Jesus raised from the dead. Mary Magdalene saw. Peter saw. He appears to the eleven apostles. Most of them don't believe. He scolds them for it. All of these people, 500 people, according at one point to St. Paul, all see Jesus. The two disciples on the road to Emmaus see him, and yet the Blessed Mother doesn't get to see him. His own mother doesn't get to see him. It is the learned opinion of most of the fathers of the church and the saints who have written on the topic or spoken on the topic that he appeared to our Blessed Mother first, in private. That's ridiculous. It doesn't say anywhere that Jesus appears in private to anyone. Really? Go to the Gospel of Luke, doubters. Go to the Gospel of Luke, where the two disciples come running back in from the road to Emmaus and kick open the door to the upper room where all those brave apostles are hanging out. And say... And they say, we've seen the Lord, we've seen the Lord. And they say, yeah, yeah, we know, we appeared to Peter privately. Jesus appeared all over the place to whoever he wants to. And given the fact that his mother is the one who caused all of this to happen, not only by her yes to the angel Gabriel, but her comment, her uh, do whatever he tells you at the wedding feast of Cana and standing there at the foot of the cross, oh, he most certainly would have appeared to her first. Because if there's anyone in human history that actually had a claim to be able to see uh, our blessed Lord on his resurrection, it would be his own mother. So, now, our blessed mother's time on earth, after the completion of her earthly life, he wants his mommy. And so he calls her to him. And there's a distinction to be made between Jesus ascended to heaven, which is he ascends on his own power, and assumes means she's drawn up. She comes to Jesus because Jesus commands her, draws her to himself. And, as we heard this morning, now she steps into the very life of the Trinity. Eye to eye. She sees God as he is in the face. 
So what she had, the great, great privilege she had of holding God in her arms in Bethlehem now comes completely full that she steps into the Trinity and sees Father, Son, and Spirit. Jesus in the flesh, Father and Son, she engages in the Trinity because she has a unique relationship to each person of the Holy Trinity. To the Father, she is daughter. To the Son, she is mother. And to the Spirit, she is spouse. And she is made complete. Raised to a supernatural perfection. An everlasting supernatural perfection. In the Trinity. By the Trinity. And our blessed Lord gets to look his mother in the face and she gets to look him back in the face and he says, welcome home, mom. Welcome home. From all eternity, from all eternity, we have waited for this moment and here it is. Nothing thwarts the will of God. Nothing. And that our Blessed Mother now, at this very moment, stands in the presence of the Trinity, arrayed in all her glory. That is our promise. That's what's held for us, not obviously to the same degree, because the grace was not extended to us in that fashion. But grace is extended to us. And this is our this is our call. This is our hope. This is our vision. This is what we were created for. I will put hatred between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. We are her offspring. It began with John at the place of the skull and continues right now to this moment with us. And that is our home. Our mother is there. Our God is there. Our brother, our blessed Lord, is there. Our Father is there. Everything that we were created for is there. And every now and then we get a little glimpse of it. We get some outpouring of an overflowing, like God just can't contain himself. Beautiful line from the Psalms, my delight is to be with the sons of men. And he draws us, pours out those graces and keeps drawing us, drawing us. Come on, ah, you've sinned, you morons, stop it. You know, go to my church, go to confession, get forgive. come, come, come. Well, sin obviously wasn't a block, wasn't even an issue in the case of her blessed mother. So she just naturally went to him. But she's our hope. Christ is our hope. She is the manifestation of our hope. She is the physical demonstration, physical, physical demonstration of our hope, realized perfectly so that everything we do, she becomes a model for. Everything holy that we participate in, she's our model we are her children. And think about this. That our mother who is physically present in heaven right now in her glorified body, that womb which carried our blessed Lord he is our brother because she is our mother. So standing right there at the foot of the cross, we were spiritually present in her womb at the crucifixion. We are her offspring. 
we consume the body and blood of her only son, firstborn son, and we become like him. And as he had a home in her womb, we do too. We are the offspring, so we were always there at the crucifixion. How fitting is it that we are there spiritually present in the womb of our Blessed Mother, that when we go to Mass, we are physically present to that very same moment, because that is the moment to which we are all drawn, to all of human history draws to that moment at the place of the skull. And we didn't have to wait to come into physical existence to experience that. We were already able to experience it spiritually in the womb of our mother then. That moment is the door to eternal happiness. And so God prepared us through her from all eternity to be present at the moment that happened and to ratify that moment 2,000 years ago on Calvary, now in the Mass. Our Blessed Mother carried the body and blood of God in her and we do too at Mass. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end, amen. Sacred Heart of Jesus, Immaculate Heart of Mary, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.